uh, we're saying the only way to get noticed is by being noticeable. And uh, we got to stand out because that's the best way of being of service. So it's almost bipolar. We want to be different without having to differentiate. <laughs> we want to stand out without having to stand out. I, I hope in chapter one, it's a rallying cry that marketing is the ultimate act of kindness. If you have something that's better than the alternatives, you know, damn it, we got a responsibility to market that. It's the only way to be of service to our customers. Starting or growing your business is hard work. But now you are listening to the Better Business Podcast with me, Steve Cook, and I'm going to try and make it a little easier on you. We on this podcast help you grow a better business with real advice from professionals, and today is no different. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Better Business Podcast. I am your host, Steve Cook, and on today's episode, this is no ordinary episode because my guest today is a name guy by the name of Mike McCallowitz. Mike McCallowitz, by his 35th birthday, had already founded and sold two multi-million dollar companies. Confident that he had the formula to success, he became a small business angel investor and then proceeded to lose his entire fortune. Then he started all over again, driven to find better ways to grow healthy, strong companies. Mike has devoted his life to the research and delivery of innovative, impactful entrepreneurial strategies to you. Today, Mike leads two new multi-million dollar ventures as he tests his latest business research for books. He's the former, he is a former small business columnist for the Wall Street Journal and a business makeover specialist on MSNBC. Mike is a popular main stage keynote speaker and an innovative on innovative entrepreneurial topics, and he is the author of Fix This Next, Clockwork, Profit First, Surge, The Pumpkin Plan, The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, and our topic for today, the book, Get Different. Mike, welcome to the show. Steve, a pleasure to have you. Have you, listen to me. Have to be on your you show. You interview me, so that'd be to amazing. Have you read that, that bio, man. That was, that's a monster bio. I gotta tighten that up. <laughs> I uh, want to talk to you about your newest book, uh, Get Different Today. Um, yeah. You know, the the foundation of the book, the whole kind of encompassing theme is this idea of dad marketing. What in the world? Explain what that means. Yeah, that's the core framework. Um, what I did was I researched out what makes marketing effective. And uh, it's not best practices. That's That was the thing that shocked me. Um, best practices are extraordinary and very applicable in many scenarios, like if you have a best practice to hire someone, Steve, I should try to replicate that and learn from you. The only time best practices does not seem to serve us is in marketing, because when we market the same way as everyone else, we are perceived to be the same as everyone else. We're ignorable. Dad is the framework uh, that I've identified that makes marketing work. And if you can check off the three boxes, you got a chance for success, not guaranteed, but a chance. And if you miss any one of these boxes, you're gonna blend in or be ignored. So the first D in dad stands for differentiate. We must do marketing that is uncommon, unexpected. And the reason we do that is it pops open the, the mind of the prospect. I remember the, the first time I received a hey friend email, I was like, oh, this is really unique. I got this friend that calls me friend. They don't even call <laughs> me by my first name. I got so friendly to them. But I was like, oh, this is irrelevant, cheesy, smarmy marketing. I don't want this. The next hey friend that came through, I ignored and I haven't read one since because I know it's irrelevant. Well, when we differentiate, it's the first, hey friend, it's the first uh, way to produce your, introduce yourself in a new way. And uh, the, it lights up our mind. We have to evaluate it. Curiosity invokes. Then the second letter in dad is attract. Attract is about speaking to the customer's interests and needs. Are you speaking the language of the customer? I could listen for, you know, first interview, Steve, I could make, have been like, oh, I'm gonna dress like a bozo the clown because like that'll totally get Steve's attention. And it, it is different. It does differentiate, you will notice, but is it attractive? And uh, it's likely not. It'll probably repel most people. Say, but this is guy's making a joke out of business. Screw him. <laughs> so we must be different, but we also must attract. And the last D is direct. Once you have garnered attention and you're retaining it, we have to move quickly toward giving the prospect a specific action to take. 
Now, the key here is it needs to be a reasonable action. I mean, I can't say, hey, uh, thanks for visiting my website. Give me a $10,000 deposit and we'll talk about me consulting you. It's, it's absurdly large and it's too risky. People will run from that. Um, the, the other risk is being too obtuse. Like come to my website and there, there's one button about my consulting. It says, learn more. Well, the whole reason someone came to my website was to learn more. So how can we get them to, toward a simple, reasonable transaction? Maybe it's, you know, download my seven tips to get the most out of consulting. And, uh, I'll give you it for, for in exchange for your email address. So the dad framework is we must be differentiated. We must be attractive, but we also must direct. If you can check those three boxes off in any marketing you do, the potential for success is amplified. If you miss any one of those, the marketing is crippled to say the least. So one situation that you brought up is that a lot of small business owners feel maybe bad or they feel like they're interrupting people's lives. And sure. chapter one talks about how they have a responsibility to actually market their products. But I want to ask you something. From my point of view, I, I wonder if if small business owners feel bad and they feel like they're interrupting people's lives when they market, or do you think that more small business owners are overwhelmed with not really knowing what to do, not knowing which platform to advertise on or, or something like that, which, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's a legitimate, uh, reason people don't market is, is overwhelm. Some people are afraid of success. Like what if this actually works? Am I, am I ready for that? Can Does I that handle that different? Yeah. And uh, it sounds absurd to, to some folks to be afraid of success, but I've, I've seen it play out where someone hits it and they're like, this is not who I am. And they're overwhelmed by it. So there is a fear though, wired into all humanity. If we go back to the cave dweller days, wired into us is fit in with a tribe, do what the community expects of you. Otherwise you're a risk to the tribe. So like if you and I are in the same tribe and you're like, Hey guys, let's go hunting for a woolly mammoth. And I'm like, Steve, 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 we're going to go for a saber tooth tiger, but everyone's in with you and you're going for a woolly mammoth. Now I've rejected the tribes collective uh, spirit, which means I'm a risk for the tribe. So I'm out in the tundra now, which is certain death. So back in the cave dweller days, rejecting the norm, not fitting in, being different meant certain death. And uh, we carry that reptilian mind with us today. So it's this kind of devil angel situation. We, we want to market and we're like, it's bothersome or I'm overwhelmed. There's a reason not to do it because we may get rejected and we don't do it. On the other side, uh, we're saying the only way to get noticed is by being noticeable. And uh, we got to stand out because that's the best way to be of service. So it's almost bipolar. We want to be different without having to differentiate. <laughs> we want to stand out without having to stand out. I, I hope in chapter one, it's a rallying cry that marketing is the ultimate act of kindness. If you have something that's better than the alternatives, you know, damn it, we got a responsibility to market that. It's the only way to be of service to our customers. So let me ask you this. What if someone's made it through chapter one and they're like, Hey, you know what? He's right. I, I do have a, a responsibility to take this product and, and, and get it to the masses, but somebody just doesn't have the money to market, to advertise. What would you say to that person? Oh, thank God. You don't have the money. You got a chance now. My money goes after the obvious, you know, if you had hundreds or thousands of dollars, you may hear, you know, run Facebook ads. That's what everyone's doing. Money goes often to where the best practices are. And uh, there's a sad lie that's perpetuated that if your marketing isn't working, you haven't done enough of it yet. And so we're like, well, I didn't get those Facebook conversions. Maybe I need to do it in a bigger way. And uh, sometimes it's the case, but rarely is that the case. Most often it's that we're blended in that we've hit this thing called habituation in the prospect's mind, meaning I've seen that hey friend before, <laughs> I don't need it. So when you don't have money, you're forced to do different. Uh, I've actually now written up about a hundred different ideas that cost nothing or, or near nothing. I'll give you an example. One thing I did is I observed what my contemporaries were doing, other authors. And I saw that everyone does an email blast, you know, uh, white background, black text, maybe there's a picture in there buy my book. So I'm like, okay, if everyone's doing black on white, what if I was the first guy to do white on white, AKA invisible. So I sent out an email, it was white text, white background. There was a one line in there that you could read in black text that said, this may be the first ever invisible ink email you've received. Click and drag below to highlight your message. Get out of here. And uh, you'd highlight it. And sure enough, it would pop it on the screen because now it's, it's highlighted over. And that one, the open rates were four times 
uh, and the click through rates four times what I've experienced with any of my other emails. And if you think about it, it applied the, the dad framework. It was different. How many invisible ink emails do you get? Uh, it was attractive because it invoked curiosity. Maybe it harkens back to when we were children, we used to pass secrets and stuff in school or, or use an invisible ink marker to reveal a message. And I had the direct built in there with the message. I told him, here's the action to take. Now you've seen this, um, to be more engaged with the work I'm doing. And uh, that was wildly successful. That's one idea that would, if, if you already have an email system, it costs nothing more to just change the text to white. And that's the type of stuff we want to look at subtle or, or simple changes that have an extraordinary impact. You got to be careful giving all this advice because then if everyone starts doing it, you become not different. So you got to be careful with that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny. It, that's a great point, Steve. So it's funny. Um, I, I, that is one, I have a hundred ideas like that. And uh, many of them I'm using right now. Here's why uh, I think it's a good idea to give the advice away. First of all, it is shocking how few people do it because it takes courage. We have to get over that devil of being bothersome or I'm not, I don't have enough time or being weird. And most people won't get over that. So there's a little threat there to me. The second thing is we're in such a diverse set of businesses. I'm the author doing that. Now, if, if other authors do that exact same thing, now I'm compromised. It's, it's, it's washed true. out. But if someone does it in the welding industry and someone does it in, I don't know, potato farming, it will work in all these categories because it's the first time the clients experienced it. It's the first time they're receiving that. Hey friend, honestly, Hey friend still works. If your community's never seen that before. True. So I put them out there and uh, sure enough, people will replicate it, but it's going to take time. And when they do, it simply inspires me to create more. I, I don't want to stick with my one idea. I want to constantly be expanding. So that's why I put them out there. So question for you. Um, chapter three, you get into this idea of a target 100 and you use this example of a, a cigar shop, um, owner and talk about how, or, or I'm sorry, he, he was a account. Oh, he solicits. Yeah. yeah. He was, he was trying Gabriel. to go towards uh, cigar shop owners. Gabriel. And, um, all I could think about during that entire chapter was what if a business doesn't have a list of clients to go after that, um, maybe it's a convenience store or maybe it's a restaurant or maybe it's a, a business that has a lot lower ticket item um, or or something that they don't really even track the customers. How would you find a target 100 if you're in a business like that? Yeah. So then you look at who does have the list. So one way is if you have an active business with no list, you can accumulate. If I have a convenience store, I can say, you know, drop your business card in our box and every uh, Friday night we're giving away uh, a six pack of Gatorade or something. So you can start collecting. Um, Shockingly, sometimes you just need to ask people say, you know what, thanks for coming to our convenience store. We want to tell you when we have specials going on, would you be willing to share your email? So sometimes the exchange is very minimal. The other thing is look at people that do have the lists. So maybe you don't have it, but the supermarket that when you have that coupon or down the street, you know, you swipe your coupon at the end of checking out uh, and it kind of rings off all the coupons, you know, that little barcode, they got your email address. Um, maybe you can strike a deal with the uh, the supermarket and do a joint venture of sorts saying, Hey, I got a convenience store. Uh, you guys have the supermarket. Um, we sell similar products, but we're, we're definitely in different spaces. Could, could we do something where, uh, we email your list and, uh, we have a special going on at our place, uh, that if they buy it, uh, they get a coupon back to your place or something that we both come out winning. So look where those lists are elsewhere and seek to, to do some kind of joint venture with those folks. So, as you move through the book, you get through the the dad concepts and you, and you kind of get almost into these different um, concepts. And chapter nine talks about this idea of um, advertising in, in a plea of differentiation, advertising what's called a disadvantage advantage. And your um, ideas in that was to, to think about the things that people knock you for, or that might be considered a yeah. disadvantage for you and turn those into an advantage. Um, so you gave this example of this guy that actually um, advertised his bad Google reviews um, oh. or, or use that as a way to, to be different. Yeah. Do you think, you know, when I was thinking of that, I, I thought that that was incredible advice, but I was wondering, do you think that that can be taken too far? Like you can actually hurt your business in any way by doing that? Oh, sure. Sure. So the disadvantage advantage is what your competition knocks you on they're promoting that, right? So uh, the guy you're referring to, he had a painting business and they're saying, oh, that, that painting company, they're unreliable. Um, so what he did was he shared a story publicly about how they painted a baby. Uh, and this is true, <laughs> talk about unreliable and how they addressed it. So it wasn't just like, oh, we, we messed up. They said, yeah, we did mess up. And 
here's how we resolve it. We won't, we, we intend never to mess up. If we do, we've got your back. Um, that's how serious we are. He was the only company explaining this. And now customers started to flock to him saying, oh, he's the truth sayer. Everyone else says they're perfect. They can't be. Now, if he simply said, yeah, we painted a baby and occasionally we do, that would hurt you. So you can, you can point to your weakness, but also talk about how you're addressing it. Um, I, I, myself, my last name is Michalowicz. It's like, it is such a horrible last name for an author in particular. I wish it was Cook or Smith, but it's not. <laughs> So I could have done like the John Mellencamp thing and say, well, now I'm John Cougar. I could have made a, a faux name for myself and some authors do that. But what I decided to do was make fun of it. And so now like when you visit my website, um, you can actually play with my name and make, make all these bastardizations about it. that's really kind of funny. Well, that's becoming endearing quality. So now people feel almost a greater rapport toward the work I do because they feel like, oh, just like my buddy, I can make fun of my buddy's name. I can make fun of that author guy's Mike's name too. So it's a rapport builder. So always, if you're gonna if you're gonna leverage one of your weaknesses, give it a, an avenue to show why that is actually your advantage. And uh, if you can have the customer engaged in that, it will actually be one of the best advantages you have. So what if someone's listening to this entire podcast and they've read the book and they say, man, that's great advice, and they say. I need to just outsource my marketing. I need to hire somebody. Do you think that that is, do you, do you plea for business owners to do their own marketing? Do you think that it can be outsourced effectively or how do how do you think that um, business owners should market their business? I think the business owner should uh, be directly involved in ensuring integrity to both who they are authentically or as the business and ensuring that they really pursue different um, and as a business grows, I believe in the business owner shouldn't be doing any of the work, but you better have an internal confidant that you trust will adhere to the brand and your differentiator. I, there's a story I put in the book about a guy named Anthony Sicari, who I am now friends with him. Uh, he owns a company called New York State Solar. And uh, he was talking about the marketing he was doing on radio, trying to sell his solar services. And uh, the radio station gives him this kind of generic, cheesy music in the background, and, and a way to process their radio spots. I'm like, we're going to do a radio spot like no one else because that's the same radio spot they're giving to everyone else. So we made this really unique radio spot. It was basically like leaving a voice message, but no music, no tones, nothing, just Anthony talking one-to-one -to, -one to you. It was the most odd, unique radio spot that he or they've ever run because the radio station called back and said, we've never heard anything like this. You can't do this. This sucks, they said. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna they said, we're going to fix it for you. And they tried to insert, uh, 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 it sounded like he's leaving a voicemail. So they added a beep, did all stuff and said, here, this is the better polished one. And I, I said, Anthony, do not fall for the, 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 the suggestions of the industry expert or a marketing source. They're following what they do for everyone else. Therefore it is carp, uh, it is common white noise. So it was tough for Anthony to do this because he said, they're the experts. I'm like, just do different. He stuck with it. Uh, the return his return was like five times the volume of customers and leads flows uh, through that spot. He now uses it uh, all the time. This is his go-to ad and he's turning it on and off because he got too much lead volume. He, he was going to abandon radio altogether because it wasn't working. This worked. So I'm not saying don't use a marketing service or a marketing agency. I, I think they're wonderful in executing, but they execute what they know with a different system they got to be either all in on different and, and can be presenting something differently, or we as the business owner at least have to take charge to make sure that we don't fall in line with other white noise. Mike, I, I want to um, ask you one final question, but before I do that, I want to um, thank you for the books that you've written. Pumpkin Plan was my favorite until oh, I love this it. book. Um, this book has has been one of my favorites that um, you've written. So I want to thank you for that and for, for being on the show today. Um, as way as way of final question, yeah. speaking of all the books that you've written, <laughs> I can't help but think you've you've written books on profitability. You've written books on on pumpkin planning, which is kind of finding your ideal client. You've written books on yeah. setting up systems, and now on marketing. If you had to boil all the stuff you know down to one piece of advice for someone who is maybe plateaued in their business or they're just starting out in business, and and boil it all down to one piece of advice. What piece of advice would you give to someone? I would argue probably the most impactful thing I can teach is actually one word. And the word is shareholder. And here's what I mean. As the word entrepreneur, business owner, 
over time has become bastardized to be hustle and grind, you know, work ethic, uh, workaholism. You will be only successful as you, as, as you work. And if you work harder, you'll have more success. And I'm telling you, that's a lie. There are early stages. You may be the only resource available, but if we abandon the shareholder man mindset, you are forever trapped. If you call yourself a shareholder, which is kind of weird. So when people ask me, uh, I actually had some lunch with some guys. I say, Oh, tell me about what you do. I said, Oh, I'm a shareholder of a couple of businesses. They're like, what do you mean? A shareholder on, on in a large global business is someone that collects profit and gives strategic direction through voting. Well, for my small businesses, that's what I do. I share in the profit. I took the risk of starting. I invested in it by starting it. And I give strategic direction. I have a president for every one of my businesses and it's not me. They're the ones who are running the business. I give it strategic direction. That's been massively freeing. And it's hard to own that term for, I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I love what it means or did mean. I just don't like how it's been bastardized. Change the frame of how you see yourself and it changes everything in your business. It's incredible advice. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Michalowicz, don't walk run to go get this book. Uh, I sure do appreciate you being on the podcast today, Mike. This has been a joy, Steve. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Better Business Podcast with me, your host, Steve Cook. You know, starting or growing a business is hard work. So I hope that today's advice made it just a little bit easier for you. We'll be sharing more about this exact topic all this week on my social platforms. You can find me on Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, or if you would like to get a, a personalized blog post from me on this topic, you can join my email list and I will send you an email once a week. You can check the show notes to subscribe to that or find me on my website, whatever's easier for you. Now get out there and go grow a better business with this advice from today's Real Pros. Thank you for listening.